Welcome to Cinema Spectator, a show where an expert and a casual movie fan watch movies in the cinematic canon. Today's film, we watched Drive, directed by Nicholas Winding Refn, starring Ryan Gosling and Carey Mulligan. My name is Cameron Tuttle. I'm joined with Isaac Ransom. Isaac, how are you doing? Give me a time and a place, <laughs> and I don't remember the rest of the line, but I'm well. I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are you, That's- Cameron? I'm I'm doing pretty good. I hear you you're doing exciting things, um, which is cool. I'm I'm happy for you. Um, it's gonna be fun to see what you, you know, what you what you what you're up to in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, well, I am good starting luck on Monday. I guess <laughs> I am starting a new job on Monday. I'm excited to see how it goes. I just I really don't know what to expect. I got a um, marketing position for a company that sells clothing for workers that work in refrigerate refrigeration warehouses um it's a very niche market and they're a small company and so there's a lot of like creative freedom and it's kind of strange to be like sitting in a position where they're like i don't know like you tell us and i'm like i think i'm a little too young for this so i think (laughs) i think i'm gonna be a little over my head with uh the new job um i am excited that it's creative i have a feeling they're gonna probably try to work me pretty hard so I'm I'm going to do everything in my power to keep this show uh, happening once a week. I think we have a pretty good um, system in place, and also some great supporters uh, to for the show. Thank you guys who support the show, and and for the guests that come on, like Tim and Juzo. You know, there's always space to fill an empty seat if I get overwhelmed. So, just all the prayers and and best wishes for starting a new job. That transition time is always very. Uh, yeah chaotic um, yeah. so just bear with me but i am really excited to see where it takes me and uh shout out to our executive producer darren he met and got coffee with me we talked about career stuff you know thanks for taking your time darren and um yeah there's been a ton of people pouring into me helping me with career stuff so it's been it's been really good but yeah, yeah. i'm excited for it thank uh thanks for uh you know asking about it too cameron I'm a yeah, little definitely. nervous and jumpy as well when it comes to it because I have no idea what to expect on Monday. So, yeah, I, well, I think I think that'll be interesting. Um, I'm I'm excited to hear how it goes. Um, so so keep me updated for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess there's. Have you been watching anything or um, doing it? We we kind of just talked recently, right? Didn't we yeah. do the show on Monday? Yeah, well, we did the show on Monday, and then we hung out on Wednesday to like do the commentary track for this film, which will be available for our Patreons at the one dollar level. Um, Tim Smith joined us, and we just hung out and watched that f- movie, which is I I think it's a really fun commentary track. We definitely uh, made fun of it a little bit. We have a lot to talk about about the stigma with this film and yeah. the, kind of the importance it has to us, and I guess our exploration of movies as we've been doing this retrospective on Cinema Spectator and. You know, I'm I'm sure you're excited to move on to some movies. We're gonna go back to the formula, guys. Don't worry. We're gonna start watching movies I haven't seen again, um, which is <laughs> which is gonna be torturous and fun, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the the icing on the cake finish. So m- most of my my movie watching and stuff has gone towards um, just what we've seen recently. I haven't been watching much. A couple TV shows here and there um with jewels like we did this we used that feature on netflix that was like play anything you know it has that shuffle Mm -hmm. and we i was just feeling so adhd that i was like i'm giving these shows like five minutes to impress me and then (laughs) it's moving on and just nothing caught i just have like tv just like is so openly wastes your time when you're watching it like when you compare it to this movie in particular too like this film ever like 90 minutes it's not gonna waste a moment and yet it also holds like like there's so much time where it's like we're wasting time for a reason you know in this movie in this film they're trying to you know have you embraced into the experience of this movie where tv shows they they waste time with dialogue that is just meaningless like it just drives me nuts like Mm. hey honey i just got home from work well how's the business well i'm gonna tell you about the job you know q2 is ending and it's i was like none of this has anything to do with what this tv show is about and they're just going on and on to fill like the 50 minute time period that the show is supposed to have and it's just it's yeah really obnoxious I think that does happen. And that's why I'm always like skeptical of people who are like, oh, yeah, TV is like, you know, you can you could be with the characters more. So it's that means it's it's like deeper. And I'm always like, 
is that all is that true is that true most of the time because most of the time when you sit with the characters you you like them less and less because they're more like they they do like more inane things um right and 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 for the most part i i definitely agree with you although i will say um the good tv shows are the ones that uh that do it well and actually do explore character and motivation and things like that um so you know obviously there's there is room for it to be better Um, yeah it's just like bad tv shows i think are um it makes it the tv format makes them worse um whereas a, a bad movie you know that's like 90 minutes long you're like okay you know that's it was it was bad but whatever but a bad tv show you're like why am i still <laughs> watching this like okay actually i did i have seen a film i just remembered it this is the problem is i can't remember anything that i ever watch anymore just because <laughs> my primary focus when it th- when it comes to like remembering what i watch most of the things i watch outside of this podcast are extremely unconsequential and this is a perfect example of that Someone told me that I really need to watch The Wedding Singer with Adam Sandler. Like, they were just like, this movie, it's like one of his best. It's just mm-hmm. so good. You know, and I just, I don't know what it is, but like, it's not that it's a bad movie. It's a fine movie. Like, Juliana liked it. It's almost like, you know, it felt like Princess Diaries in some way, where it's just <laughs> kind of, which, I mean, uh, Cameron, I actually know that you love Princess Diaries. I, think, I do I think, love Princess Diaries, I think, yeah. I think that movie is <laughs> is is fine, you know? It's very, like... It, it's just run of the mill, very like pleasant. And I would say the same thing about the wedding singer. That's, I just, I don't understand Adam Sandler. I don't think he's that funny. Mm. Um, but he plays a role in this movie. That's a little bit less obnoxious than normal. <laughs> so I could appreciate that. Uh, I just, I don't know. It was just a strange, it's such a strange recommendation for someone to be so passionate about a movie that seems so like generic in a, mm. in a way, that's interesting. That's, it's, so, it's so weird. I feel like maybe that movie is just like I feel like it's it's one of those films where someone just enjoyed it a lot at the right time at the right place, you know. And maybe like it, it would be like me saying you have to watch Princess Diaries. <laughs> like I would just like never say that to someone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. good. Like if you're vibing with it, I'm all about it, you know. And I I can appreciate it, but I'm not going to that's not going to be like the first movie that pops in my head. that you're, I'm like, you need to see. And someone like literally did that with this. Sure, movie. sure. Um, and I was just like, I, I just don't see it. I don't get it. I just, it just seems normal. It seems like a normal Adam Sandler film. So anyway. Yeah. Was, well, the one thing about Adam Sandler that I think is like he he's proven himself to be. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I wasn't really like into him in his like hate it obviously so it's possible that he has more um funny movies that that i'm just discounting but to me he has more impactful serious movies and serious roles than he he does funny roles um so i think i think he's actually a really good serious actor um and is should have sort of a comeback in in my mind i, I want him oh, yeah. to do like more roles like uncut gems or more roles where he's like even even like a bit part in in some movies like he could he could have like a ray romano you know as as uh the buffalino <laughs> lawyer in in the irishman you know right, like, I, right. Think, I think adam sandler is actually really good for something like that so I I haven't seen Uncut Gems, but he seems like he can f- play more dramatic roles with like flying colors. Because I've I've watched yeah. little bits of that, and he just like capture he just like grabs you by the neck and just pulls your attention. There's something about him that is energetic when he's acting in a role that just f- like flows with his personality, right? I would um, highly recommend Un- Uncut Gems. Actually. Yeah, um, I do. I do want to watch it. Movie. I hear it's very intense, and so like it's hard for me to be like on a Friday night with Jules, like, "Hey, let's watch this super intense like <laughs> movie that you're probably gonna not like," you know. Um, but I, I think she, if she's in the right mood, that's definitely one I'm gonna go for. But yeah. Uh, anyways, that those are the only things I can think of 
my watching experiences. How about you, Cameron? Have you seen I, anything recently? No, I've been, I've watched nothing uh, in the past like three days. So yeah, um, yeah. I I uh, like I said, I'm trying to go through Fargo, but I really haven't been um, able to. I've been busy. So um, yeah. Uh, other than that, not much. Not much. Yeah. I have I've kind of stopped playing video games too for a little bit. So but just this week, I've just been really busy trying to get things yeah. sorted so busy boy well this is cinema spectator you can support us at patreon.com slash ecfs productions throw a couple dollars our way get access to those commentary tracks or benefit episodes we do exclusive episodes once a month for you guys that support us you can have your questions read on air a bunch of other benefits check it out there if you don't have a few dollars, it's all good. Just tell friends and family. Give us a rating on iTunes. That seriously helps the show grow with the algorithm. Just punch it in five stars. It means a lot. Uh, yeah, that's that's all the shilling I got for us. We can get right into it. Let's talk about Drive 2011, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Drive is kind of the, um, I would say, the high point of Nicholas Winding Refn's career uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Although he's made you know more expensive movies since then, but... Um, yeah, Drive, I would say, is kind of his um, uh, magnum opus in a lot of ways. Before this, he did two movies. Um, well, he he had, he had a handful of features in the early 2000s that were kind of lower budget, um, more in- independent. And then he made Bronson in 2008 um, with uh, um, Tom Hardy. Uh, and he made Valhalla Rising um, as well right, right before... Um, right before drive. So, uh, this is kind of him, uh, like, you know, hitting his, his stride. And then I think after this movie, he became sort of like thrust into the mainstream, uh, in, you know, in, in, in a different sense. And he kind of used that. I don't want to say like uh, in a bad way necessarily, but like, um, he made bigger budget, weird movies still. So, um, he, he's an interesting director. I don't think he's really working that much right now. Like he hasn't, I don't think he's made a movie since, um, uh, 2016. Um, he did do a mini series in 2019. Uh, but yeah, he's, I, I don't want to say he's fallen off necessarily, but he hasn't been doing quite as much recently. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of just a brief summary into kind of an independent director where this movie is like his big one hit wonder, I I would say. Um, uh, other than that, you know, obviously Ryan Gosling, um, was very famous in this era, um, coming off of, um, mostly like romantic comedies, uh, at the time. And this movie was kind of outside of his normal wheelhouse. And I think also thrust him into, more and more um unique roles artistic roles and ones that kind of showed off his acting chops um but yeah that that's kind of i don't know there's not much background on this movie because it it happened like a decade ago it wasn't wasn't that long ago so right um it's you know it comes out of a a time that had i would say in my mind the 2010s were actually a very good decade for for film um but you know this this early period there was some interesting um examples of of movies that you know either took genre movies and kind of flipped them upside down or or just experimented with um w- with different ideas in in genres and i think this is a good example of a movie that does that um in a in a unique way uh for the time (laughs) maybe not so unique now but um yeah yeah it feels like this perfect amalgamation of inspiration and almost like you know mixture right like they it's a perfectly balanced recipe um that creates something that has its own identity but it's also pulling from so much that you appreciate i mean we when we were talking about it right like just the score and it's um like almost like the beginning of 80s nostalgia in a modern setting right like there's like this this character in the film just in its setting that really connects with the audience i think i think it's difficult not to find 
some sort of charm in in the way that it's presented. Mm. Um, yeah, this this movie I have a really interesting relationship with because you know I have seen it. Usually, our show is designed around artistic films that Cameron has picked, and then he shows it to someone like myself who doesn't have as much experience. But to watch this movie now after a year of you know being exposed to a lot of different classic cinema movies um it's it's special to me right like i Mm. this this movie my first experience with it was like when i was coming out of college or or just starting college sorry coming out of high school and this was like that first like kind of gritty artsy like movie that caught me off guard and i was like this is different it's weird it's like the camera work is beautiful like the people don't say anything they don't need to say anything you know uh it's like it it has the cool music it has the cool look and there's a lot of heart to this this film and a lot of artistry in it and i was like this is this is an awesome movie and as time has gone on right it's a, it's 11 years old or 10 10 years old now right um this movie has created a stigma where people you know they're like this is this is my artistic underground choice of a movie right like this is the one that i want to talk about with people and or it, it's, it's almost like it, like i would consider it to be like f- like kind of film school bro-ish you yes know? And, exactly and in a similar way to like tarantino's movies um that why people you know hate on tarantino is not necessarily because of his movies it's because of p- people who like his movies yeah um and i think this is kind of the same thing where people people i think people actually genuinely like this movie uh but because the the film school bros are like you know were were like really into this movie at the time it's kind of it kind of does have a bad name or bad stigma i guess and it's hard not it's hard to blame the film the the film school guys for it because like this movie is obnoxious it's like obnoxiously like crafted and can be over analyzed in so many different directions from just the framing to you know a lot of symbolism in the movie uh some of the some of the writing and all that i just it's it's a very strange concoction that I I think what I'm so surprised by, right? And this is kind of why we talked about the Florida Project as well, right? Is this movie re- can be like this textbook, you know, pro- like movie that people could pull apart for like years, right? And yet it can be also consumed in such a like distant manner. For someone like myself who didn't have a lot of understanding of movies at the time watching it, mm. I was like, I understand it because it's like there's this feeling. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like there's this feeling that resonates through the film and you're like, oh, like I kind of understand what this person was trying to put together, even if I don't understand the specific mechanics of the way it was made or the design choices with the script or the way the characters are you know, represented or the way that, that the camera is held at a certain angle, right? I might not understand those things, but they all come together to create a feeling that is like almost universally understandable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, I think that is the real charm with this movie for me to revisit it with a little bit more of a understanding of movies and how to i guess chew on them right to come back to this one and almost double appreciate it right like that was that was a um an an exciting experience for me cameron how many times have you seen this movie um probably only like four or five this might have been like my fifth time I'm, i'm not entirely sure um it's a movie that i think has um uh, whether or not I've seen it a lot, because I I feel like I don't revisit it necessarily all that yeah, much, but yeah. I remember so much about it. Um, right, like I, I I distinctly remember almost at, like all of the sequences within it, um, and they all kind of like, I they're they're almost like burned into your brain, 
Um, and partly for like exactly what you were saying, because it, it's so uniquely shot um, and, you know, visually is is so distinct that I think it, it actually it works. Um, it's almost like it, it works better, even though, you know, like it, it works better for even like casual people, because um, whether or not you you know, pick up on necessarily all of the things that are, that are going on, you can tell that there's something unique and it, it it's not going to like leave your, your brain necessarily, you know, yeah. like you're going to, it's, it's going to sort of sink in and, and not let you go. Um, and, and I think, I think this movie did that to me for sure. Um, which is why I, I probably can't even remember how many times I've seen it, you know, just because it's so, um, even just the first time I was so uh, in, enraptured by it. Um, the funny thing is though, it it's, it's kind of an example of, um, well, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll kind of get into what we think this, this movie, like if it's for everybody or if it's for, you know, for people who are curious, because um, one of the things kind of famously about the release of this movie uh, was that um, audiences were not sure what to make of it because it had, you know, sort of almost like, you know, marketing that was not necessarily representative of what the movie was. You know, it was, right. it was kind of made out to be a chase movie. It was made out to be, you know, it's called Drive. You know, so it's got it's got like this this element that um you know, people would were were going into it thinking it was going to be like an action movie. Um, yeah. When it's not really, it's not really an action movie at all. Um, but you know, I don't know. I think, I think that's another reason why it's it's sort of subversive in in a certain way because it it kind of the it makes you want to lean into more of the the personal aspects of this film and less of the um crime action car chase sequences right which are still great you know still fun but not kind of the point of the movie right, and not there's, what you take away from it there's not very much like action heist stuff in this movie right uh i i, I remember that our friend jd who's uh, a big fan of the show. Like when I first saw this movie, I was like, dude, you got to see it. And then he watched a bunch of trailers on it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thought he knew what he was getting into and then watched it and was like, that was so weird. Like, I just didn't expect that. And it's not that he like necessarily disliked the movie. I think he just wasn't, he didn't understand. He, like it, it, he went in expecting one thing and he expect, I think the big thing with this movie is a lot of people expected baby driver out of this movie. And it was yeah. not that. You know, um, I think that the less you know about this film, the better. And that's why we haven't really even talked about plot. Right. If you haven't seen this movie, I don't think it's super important to know what the plot is, because even if I just read like the brief description, you have a wrong understanding of what the movie's about, <laughs> you know, like, honestly, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. And so I think really what's special about this movie is how it's able to to I, I like create the feeling you know i i know that's such a weird phrase um because a lot of film people are like oh i don't feel anything anymore and this movie made me feel something mm -hmm. but i think what's so awesome about this is that it will engross you in a feeling whether you're a film snob or just somebody who doesn't understand anything at all right like i think that's that's kind of what i really enjoyed about this is that there is this like this mending of aesthetic that is almost enough to carry it and then even more so there are layers under the film that keep you continually engaged from the conflict and your the protagonist to the love interest to like you know trying to understand sort of the criminal underworld around them. Um, like there are all these other elements that are engaging, but I think the primary pull for me in this movie is that, that undeniable feeling that it is able to 
engross you in if that makes sense i i don't know yeah no i i totally agree there's it's it's almost like aesthetic more than anything um you know because it's not really that <laughs> the the plot and what happens in the movie it is not that important um mm-hmm. not to say that it's bad necessarily or it's like poorly done i actually think the characters are interesting because they have like such little about them that you know and then you know every now and then you get sort of a, a glimpse into their lives or a glimpse into their um you know what they're what they're feeling but for the most part the plot is like really um it, it doesn't really matter all that much what you care about and what draws you in even just from the opening sequence is like how um how just like good feeling it is to watch um you know to watch what's happening like it's it's almost you can't describe it any other way but um it makes you feel cool and awesome yeah <laughs> you know yeah. like it's there's no um you know i i, I don't want to put it too uh, too much more intelligently than that because it's 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 really that that it just makes you feel good <laughs> You know, like it's just it's just is cool to watch like L.A. at night. And, you know, it's and he's, you know, weaving in and out of the cars and there's the the 80s synth music and like it's noir ish. And, you know, you get this like it's that's fun. And then the next sequence is is fun. And then the next sequence is fun and fun, you know, and everything, everything just goes on being um, really outstandingly. Uh, interesting and pull and it pulls you in from an, an aesthetic level um and i guess you know to be fair i'm sure there are people who don't like it necessarily because of that or who don't who aren't really interested in in that aesthetic um and i'm sure that is a block to 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 them getting connected to the movie in in some ways if that makes sense yeah, I definitely think that expectations plays a large role in the way that you consume this movie. I think it is leaning towards the cinephile side first and foremost because if you are going in as like a Marvel munching popcorn going movie watcher, right? And you're going to sit in the theater and try to experience this movie like turn my brain off sort of thing. Like that's not what it wants you to do you know like it wants you to be drawn in by some mystery and the decisions made with the film but even if you don't understand like the construction of it all like I still think that you will be able to experience like that 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 feeling I don't know I'm trying to compare I'm trying to think of a movie that is is comparable in a way that is like kind of slow and takes its time with like, like you think to yourself, man, this is just so cool. Even though almost like nothing is happening in, in, in some kind of manner. I would Um, honestly, I would say, um, you mentioned Blade Runner last night. I think, I think Blade Runner is a good example. mm. Um, because not that there's nothing that goes on in in the movie obviously you know it's got a it's got an interesting plot but for i would say for the most part that movie is not like <laughs> it's not like going at like an extreme pace and you kind of see where everything is going in some i mean maybe that's just me cuz i watched it you know uh, 30 years after it came out but right uh, but uh that movie is one that i think shares the same sense of aesthetics more than uh, is really like deeply um impactful on uh like an emotional level you know yeah. whereas like blade runner 2049 um or 2042 what 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 is it is it 2049 know, people don't understand what you're saying whatever um uh the, like that actually does have like an emotional cue uh, and is the aesthetic. Um, so I, I don't know. I think I definitely think there are mu- movies. Um, honestly, even um, some of the noir, like uh, uh, what was the noir movie we watched um, by Howard Hawks? Um, the sleep one or something? Yeah. The big sleep. Yeah. That, that kind of is similar um because right. the the plot isn't necessarily that important in that movie. I mean it's interesting and you kind of get engaged with the um with the 
the characters and you kind of like the, there's like humanity in in spliced in there in a lot of ways uh but the the aesthetic and the noir feeling and just how cool it is um is kind of what engages you uh, in in that movie um for some reason i'm always thinking about like christopher nolan's batman trilogy with with almost comparing it to like how you expect action from drive but you don't necessarily get it right like some of those some of the the moments in the dark knight trilogy right it's like there's barely any batman parts you know what i mean like it's like there's just a heavy emphasis on the world and really like batman only gets moments of like standing on buildings like he barely fights <laughs> anybody in the movies right like yeah there's um yeah it's like it's kind of like that where there is this coolness factor. Like, of course he's cool. He's Batman. So we're just going to show, show you like an aerial helicopter shot of him standing on a building. Um, and, and that's almost like enough, right? Like it's not, you don't even need to see him fight the thugs. Like Mm. we'll give you one scene where he fights the thugs, like the way you want him to. But after that, like, you know, we're just going to focus on the stuff around him. I feel like drive has a little bit of that where it's like, we're going to show you, a getaway scene and then you get it. You don't need to see any more of it. Right. Like you're, we're, you're going to, you're going to see different things that the mm. driver does. Right. We're yeah. going to, you're going to experience different stuff with that. So yeah, I think that can be a blocker for someone if they have that expectation. Um, I really do think that this is a fun movie to get into. If you've never like enjoyed, I guess like, heady cinematic art movies like i think this is a really approachable one for you to try to get into it and even like laugh and pretend to be like oh yes sip sip look at me i'm watching a classic artsy film and this is me talking as like someone who doesn't really consider themselves in that in that scene right and for me this was like a really approachable movie for it it felt like I could be part of the conversation. You know what Mm. I mean? Like that, that's kind of how I felt. And I think you were, you compared it well with like the bro, the, the film school bros, right? Like I get it, but there is something nice to know that you can just approach this and, and begin your journey in some sort of way. Maybe, maybe I'm just speaking out of bias because that's how I felt like I started, but it will. No. Yeah. I think, I think it's true. Um, although I will say, you know, like, like I don't want to necessarily overstate how like artsy this is and like how like ooh it's like so different you know what I mean because well like is it different yeah and and a a little bit but it also it works as a a good action movie it also works as a good sort of crime thriller yeah it also works as just a a, just a fun interesting movie like you don't have to sell it more than it than it really needs to be it's just right it's just great you know like whether or not it it has cool unique cinematography whether or not you know they oh they stare at each other because there's it's so moody like that's all that's all fine and good but it, it it just works like there's no there's no need to to be um well, I guess this is uh, maybe this I'm calling out the film school bros I guess but there's not there's not necessarily a need to like dive deep into this movie really like mm. the, the this movie is as good as it is because it exactly knows what it what it wants to be you know it it doesn't it doesn't necessarily need to be you know taken so so deeply or so metaphorically or you know we don't need to like draw uh you know uh draw fibonacci sequences on it or anything like we don't it's that's fine like we could do that if you want (laughs) but like it's totally not necessary you could just take it as it is um and it doesn't need to be anything more than you know just cool like that's it (laughs) that's that's what it is it's just cool um so I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of, I think that's why the film school bros get a lot of bad rap, uh, in my mind. Um, because they, they take things that were cool already and they try to make it like 
even better and deeper and like whoa it's right like so right. innovative but it's like it doesn't need to, no it's fine like, i think some you know good. some people just want to talk about movies that they really like you know yeah and yeah, so definitely yeah it's it's easy to talk for a long time on a movie you enjoy even i mean like here's a perfect example for some reason people have overanalyzed star wars to like the ends of the earth when in reality it is just kind of a good movie. Just leave it alone, you know? Right? Like, just let it be. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, under, I understand what you're saying. I think... Let's talk about some of this the this movie's, like, quirky, artsier things. Because I know that you're like, you don't need to make more out of it. But I think some of the charm for someone that's a little bit more versed in analyzing cinema right is to be able to dive into it a little bit and i feel like it's almost contradicting what you're saying is like it doesn't need to be analyzed but it it can so easily be done it's being set up for it cameron like i i agree with what you're saying but it's also like it's like begging you to write a paper on it do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i i mean i i sort of I, I understand, but at the same time, like, um, like what, what interests me, me the most personally is how well it's staged and blocked, like within the frame, like that's yeah. interesting to me. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything within the context of the movie. I just think it's interesting how they, you know, he uses a lot of quadrants. He like puts people in like the far right corner, the far left corner. He uses that to kind of, um, distance people in the frame and make it like uh you know make it seem like they're far apart or make it seem like they're they're sort of close together you know like that that is interesting to me and also you know he uses light in a very unique way um you yeah. know lighting cues are very dramatic in this movie very um you know al almost like too like too over the top, like almost like verging on melodramatic in, in some sequences, um, which is kind of the point, I think. But but I like that is what is uh, most interesting to me. Like, I don't particularly care about like whether or not he's like a good guy or like a good character or like supposed to be like a, a hero or something like obviously i think the movie is kind of hinting to it but um you know like that is like char the character analysis i actually think is is boring <laughs> and i wouldn't i wouldn't make like a character analysis of this movie personally but i that's think just me you know, I think what's more interesting, because I agree with you, I think the framing and the cinematography, this movie was one of the first films where I was like, wow, like there's just something, there's an attention to detail that I haven't noticed in movies where they're they're mm. pointing the camera like a weapon, you know, like it's like that we're intentionally designing shots to be stared at and like almost pull meaning out of the the angle when most movies don't even think about that in some ways, mm -hmm. right? There's like the camera is a, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, but it's like, um, means to an end instead of ends to a mean, I guess <laughs> if that, may, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, like there's, there's a lot of intentionality with, with camera angles. I agree with you. I think instead of analyzing the characters, I think the character construction with like the simplicity is something that I pulled out in this viewing. It's almost like, like you said it, there's, there's so little that it allows you to fill in gaps for yeah. yourself. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I found that really unique in, in this sitting. I think it was the third time I've watched this movie. Um, or fourth. Wow. Actually. Yeah. So, but I'd never noticed that before. Like, um ryan gosling the driver characters like he's just so silent and shy and it was interesting cameron how you're like oh like just look how effective it is with him being like a shy character and the awkwardness is so like it's it somehow works and you're saying like he's attractive so it works right or something like that <laughs> like, like this interesting thing well from, you were you were mentioning about how you know you felt like some of the things were a little creepy but i was saying that uh 
things that are that could be could come off as creepy oftentimes don't when the person is really attractive so yeah um you know like things th- i think he you know maybe him being shy he gets away with certain things but i was also saying like he um obviously we were making jokes about his intelligence which is which is <laughs> funny during that was a great moment during yeah. the commentary but yeah. um uh we you know i i was saying how it's interesting that you see him sort of the only person who he opens up to is the kid right um, yeah. and obviously that comes back later with his relationship and why he decides to help out Oscar Isaac is, you know, you, you get that connection. He doesn't have to like go into it, like a monologue about how, Oh, he, you know, we, you know, whatever. I love, uh, I just love you guys so much. And that's why I'm doing this for, you know, like there's no need for that. And, and then it comes back even later in a really effective scene with, um, Blanche, I think is the lady's name. Um, where he, you know, he he says, you got, well, spoilers, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but he says, you got, um, you know, someone's father killed. You know, right. he didn't even say, like, you got, like, Carrie Mulligan's husband killed or whatever. You know, like, he said, like, you got a person's father killed. Like, he cares the most about the kid, and you actually get that intuitively, without there being any any explanatory dialogue or anything like that you get it just based on the fact that he's he opens up to the kid in a way that is that is interesting um where you know where's his character for the most part is just he just kind of stares <laughs> blankly yeah. um, well it was interesting what i pulled away from him this time is i think he i i was mentioning like the legend of zelda and how link is expressionless and uh, almost empty. It never speaks a word, right? And how that allows the audience to almost embody their own character in that game. And I think in the context of a video game, it makes way more sense because you're controlling a character, right? Whereas this movie, it like, he's very quiet. He doesn't say very much. And it almost allows the audience to st- step into his place at certain points. I don't think in all moments, mm-hmm. right? When there's when there's violence and, and acts of revenge, right? Like, I think you become less associated or connected with, yeah. you know, the driver. Well, and I think intentionally on the movie's part, too. Right. You know, whenever he puts on the jacket or whenever he's, you know, he's, like, it's it's almost like his, his alter ego, you know? Um, yeah. And like he becomes, he becomes monstrous in a lot of ways. Like that scene in the, uh, uh, like the coffee shop or the bar or whatever, um, where mm-hmm. someone like comes up to him, yeah, and he's, he's like, I'll, "I'll kick your teeth in if you." Yeah, say like, <laughs> yeah, <"Whoa."> yeah. <laughs> and you're like, this guy has said like literally five words in the movie so far, and he's like just threatening to, <laughs> to yeah. kill someone here, you know? And it, yeah, it's 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 pretty interesting. Um, yeah, well, and I I guess like I I think you're you're somewhat right about him being like in those quiet moments him being sort of um it in some ways like you can relate to him more I guess as an audience member. Not necessarily that you're being him, but you can relate to him as someone you know, like if they filled in his personality with a personality and like maybe people would be uh, put off by certain things he said or maybe, you know, like like imagine if he was like if he was like super machismo or something, you know what I mean? Right, like, right. Like we were would... talking about recasting uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Gosling. <laughs> who, 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 who was the person we, we decided Will Ferrell um, or Steve Buscemi, <laughs> Steve Buscemi <laughs> as the driver. That's the one that I thought was too funny as Steve Buscemi as the driver would have just <laughs> absolutely obliterated this movie. Like it just would have been uh, ruined. But also maybe <laughs> not. So maybe funny. It, yeah, maybe it would have been a whole new a whole new level, right? Um, but. yeah well but I mean but my my point is that there's um, like you're right that they that there is a an element to it that you know makes you connect with him more um, but also like I think he's he's not like awkward 
like it doesn't it doesn't feel forced necessarily like his shyness you know like you you actually like sense that there's like a little bit of of like actual like it's actually really good acting but you you sense that there's like a bit of apprehension like he doesn't he doesn't really know what to say because he's not usually in these situations and then when he is in a, in a situation where he's like confident and on top of things he's the dominant one you know what i mean like yeah. he's he totally switches to being um uh, you know that monster like i said like the scene in in the um in the strip club or whatever um with the the uh partner or the boss or whatever what's that what's that guy um he's like the cook the like underling basically yeah cook um you know that sequence is so brutal and you get a sense that he he just like <laughs> he's taken control basically you know yeah, what i mean that... like he, he's he's taken over um and that's not some that's not like something that he displays necessarily within his personal life but the confidence is actually maybe more scary because you you haven't seen that before yeah one of the um, things you brought up on the commentary was like the the like almost the horror of a silent rage right yeah in in this movie it's like it's pretty scary right <laughs> like he has he has a um it like i i guess i i thought of batman because it's almost like batman has well certain versions of batman have like a relentless nature against criminals and and it's like i don't know like it's like it's he, he batman embodies like a terrifying creature that is like almost like torturing and and hunting like these evil people and i think that there's like this element around his his character with this the scorpion jacket where it's just like he's you almost never you never doubt that he like isn't going to succeed you know like does that mm. kind of make i i'm just tripping on my words but it's like he's untouchable like you don't ever think that he's like in in a similar way that batman is i would right. say actually yeah um you don't you never think that he's gonna fail right and then the first viewing i think i was like really interested because the only other threat against him that seems competent and also dominant is uh albert brooks character the bernie the Bernie guy, the mob boss guy. Yeah. Um, he, he has like this sharp truth about everything that he says and, and he's terrifying in a completely different way. Too. Right. Right. Yeah. So to see their, 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 like, uh, their, their meeting, like there's so much tension between them. And I love how, like you see towards the end of the movie, they're, conflict unfold but it also cuts between them just staring at each other like there's like this <laughs> ultimate like alpha on alpha moment at the end <laughs> right um yeah and then cutting to their you know fight at the end i don't want to spoil it but uh i just think the way that they they design that is like just two terrible monsters facing up against each other and then they have that amazing like chinese backdrop behind them at that restaurant the great wall and you see like the dragons behind them and stuff i don't know it's pretty uh it's pretty epic yeah and well it's it's interesting because um you mentioned about the silent rage thing like i'm just thinking of like imagine if this was um like uh vin diesel or like the rock or something you know what i mean like imagine if it was like a stereotypical like fast and furious movie like they'd be like doing like one-liners and quips and you know and it would totally take away the the scariness of like his character you know yeah. like, like yeah. it would it would completely destroy how um i i like just how unique the the act of seeing someone just like totally uh freak out and destroy someone in an, in an elevator like that you you know he ends he's like booyah or something like i don't know like i Steve just shemmy's <laughs> drive it just it turns into a karate fight with knives in the chinese restaurant or something like <laughs> something so terrible uh, yeah i i don't know I've, but i you know what i mean like the, it would it would take a, like the silence actually adds a lot to how scary of a 
of, you know, if we're going with like the idea that he's some sort of a superhero or he's some sort of a, like a Batman type character, um, like it, it takes a, like the silence is what kind of adds the, the, uh, like how terrifying what he actually does is, you know, like it, it, yeah. you, you know, when you see him flip out, it's, uh, it's pretty effective because he's so calm and he's so nice to children. <laughs> right. Right. There's, yeah, he really isn't a good guy per se, but I think the motivation of protecting like the innocent makes you just root for him more. I mean, it's not like you're going to root for anybody else in, in the situation. Right. Well, you root for Carrie Mulligan. Yeah. But- I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I I feel like she after watching this movie a lot, like Carrie Mulligan kind of falls to the background more than I remember. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's interesting because I think the first time I watched it, I was really invested in their like relationship and how they were connecting. And in this most recent viewing, it was almost like I didn't even pay attention to that. Like I was more um I was more interested in like the driver's just blank emotion throughout all of it and when he would come alive and when he wouldn't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was like more interesting to me. So yeah, I mean, I think there's so much to talk about with this movie. And I think to Cameron's point earlier, there's so much that really doesn't need to be explored because it can be taken at face value. I didn't want to just leave it at like, you don't need to talk about it because we obviously we're doing a podcast so we're going to talk about it um but yeah i think actually your point about that cameron is um almost the highest praise this movie can receive in some ways yeah so. yeah i no i uh, well i mean i you know it is a great movie like i don't want to undersell this movie at all it's it's um it's excellent and you know i think it the reason why people want to, you know, to take it or like, you know, deconstruct it and, you know, want to analyze things is because it's good. Um, hmm. And and that's 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 totally understandable. You know, uh, I, I don't I don't know. I don't feel like that. I feel like that makes a lot of sense. Like people are people are completely interested in. Um, well, c- people are completely invested in this movie, and by the end, they want to think about it and want to be back in the world and want to sort of like soak in that in the feeling again. And that says a lot. That goes for a lot of yeah. Um, you know, like that's more than basically. I would say ninety nine percent of movies can say, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, I mean, hats off to this movie. It's 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 great. It's it also being ninety minutes. Whew, incredible. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the best thing ever. That's it. I we were just saying how we love ninety minute movies. How they they work so well. Usually, I mean, obviously they're bad ninety minutes minute movies. Let's not <laughs> scare ourselves. Movie five, but here. <laughs> well, okay. I don't I don't want to talk about that, Isaac. <laughs> um. But that was probably the longest 45 minutes of your life, Cameron, huh? Uh, actually, the first 15 I was in it, you know, yeah. I was in it, but <laughs> that's, an, that's the last, another topic for another day. The last 10 minutes of that movie, I well, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to be like Christina Hendricks in that bathroom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what an awful slow mo moment. That is just it's pretty yikes. great. Yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> Cameron, I can't. <laughs> Whoa. I um just just so the audience knows, I forced Cameron to watch Scary Movie Five, um, and we recorded like fifteen or forty five minutes of a commentary track, and it was just obviously no one has seen this movie right <laughs> but it is it it is just such a shocking um like why it even exists i don't even know like i don't even know how it got past anything but um to subject cameron to it after a year of uh different movies that he forced me to watch was just 
the best form of revenge, I think. I would rather watch it than Monica Mata, I guess. Um. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather get through the whole thing. At least it's... Sh- well, Monica Mata is 90 minutes? Is no, it's two it? hours. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> At least it's 30 minutes less. But I feel somehow that it might be more painful, you know? Mm. Well, I think, I think honestly, we watched the the good parts of it you know we we got past the the vacuum party we got (laughs) we got past all of the baby uh abuse (laughs) okay well uh we're let's finish our thoughts on um drive because i think what i was gonna say is like 90 minute movies are are awesome we should make more of them stop making two and a half three hour movies okay unless you're martin scorsese or making the new dune movie that looks pretty good sure but yeah i mean i guess so but you know let's make more 90 minute movies how about that i know streaming has allowed us to do whatever we want nowadays you know we can make movies six hours if we want no how about no 90 minutes <laughs> don't you want to watch justice league the snyder no. cut for... <laughs> no no how long I was don't. that again like four hours or something yeah it was like four hours oh, i did watch it i know yeah that that movie is Yikes. More 90 minute movies, please. More. I'm for that. I'm totally for I that. Think, I, I think I think like uh the thing is like an hour and forty five minutes, isn't it? It's like pretty short. Yeah. See? Perfect. Yeah. It's the perfect length. I agree. I agree. I you know, I think that I'm really hung up on where to recommend this film. Like it, it, we we read on a scale of for everyone, for casuals, for curious, and for cinephiles. I don't think that this movie is for everyone, um, especially if you spent time watching trailers and reading descriptions and, you know, ruining the film for yourself. Uh, I I do think that it can go for the casuals. That's how I watched it, and I, I absolutely loved it. I, w- I made Jules watch it, who is pretty critical of movies, especially, you know, dramatic movies violent movies she's not usually drawn to but she was like i get it you know she was like i get it this is cool right uh and that i feel like that goes a a long way for her who she she doesn't pay attention to movies at all she she gets bored of them very quickly so back when we watched it she was like yeah that's like i understand why this has an aesthetic and it's important culturally in some ways right she's a recording artist so there's a lot of inspiration in music um from this film as well, I think. You know, even we were talking about like the weekend's recent album, how there's like an eighties obsession in in uh his his last work in twenty twenty. And it's like honestly, I don't know if that would exist if this movie hadn't kind of like like lit the fuse and started the 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 track record for it. So yeah, yeah. I, I kind of agree. Um also, you know, like it kind of did bring back a terrible, like there was like knockoffs of the soundtrack in a lot of, Mm. you know, different, different areas of media, not just with movies even, but um, there were some bad ones and some actually really good ones. Like hotline Miami is a really good example of this movie being very inspirational and sort of the aesthetic of that, of that video game. Um, But I would say for the most part, there have been some bad, like, oh, we're trying to be synthwave and, like, cool. And, like, yeah, most of the time it doesn't work. Um, yeah. This, I, like, I, it was obviously inspired by movies of the 80s, not inspired by Drive. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how this movie has had, like, some pop culture call outs. It's specific, in gaming, right? Hotline Miami. There's a a literal like scorpion jacket you can find on the ground in the pixel art, which is cool. I would say the first game represents a like hyper stylized, you know, pink and neon version with like the thumping, like synth bass stuff in it. All I mean, is a whole nother animal. I think that that game is awesome. Um, but it's yeah, that that's a whole nother topic. Even like one of the greatest selling video games of all time now, like grand theft auto five, there's there's a um I think there's a huge inspiration in that game from this movie. You can look at the there you can find a jacket that has a golden crab on the back of it, almost as like a parody for this, and you can yeah. you can get different different 
stuff in that game that relates to it. But I think what you're talking about is like the the o- overt like corporate like gross version of the 80s callback. I mean, I think that like this movie started to place it in and then to the mainstream like the first season of Stranger Things like really brought forward like that nostalgia hunger, right? And then you look at like uh what 2020s call of duty black ops cold war which just has the most obnoxious like oh this is in the 80s and this is cool again right and it's like yeah we we've we understand that like the 80s is 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 cool and trendy or whatever but it seems so half-baked in that yeah where like this feels and i also think that this movie has like that that 80s inspiration but it's still in a modern setting i think that's such a cool mixture like to be able to do that um and and strike that that almost nostalgic but new sort of like balance anyways i i feel like you could, you go on and on about about this topic but i think that this is like definitely a key factor to starting off the nostalgia hunger mm. in the yeah, tens yeah I, I totally agree so any other thoughts, Cameron, on this movie? I think it's been overly talked about, as as you mentioned. But I thought it was important to revisit, especially after our cinematic journey uh, on this show. And I'm ready to get into a new year of film with you, Cameron. Do you know where we're starting and where we're going? Or, um, I've got some ideas although uh, you know obviously October is coming up, so we're gonna do more horror. Um, I think that'll be fun. I love you know there's so much more that we could dive into. So I can't, I actually can't believe it's already been almost a year since we've done that. But, um, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for, for, uh, for, you know, horror month, uh, in October, September, uh, we'll see. I have a couple different ideas that I'm sort of putting together in my head. Um, but I'll let you know, I I don't want to announce anything quite yet. So, Cinema Spectator is trying to expand its show. We're trying to come up with a little bit more of a structure. Obviously, this episode was more freeform, and we're working on improving the podcast itself. Like, large shout out to Tim Smith, who is one of our producers now. Uh, He wants us to improve it, and so we are going to do our best. And so, to start this trend of improvement, Cameron, I would like to introduce a new section that will probably be at the beginning of the show but we're going to do it for the close and obviously if you stayed through the end of the episode you're one of our one of our bigger fans for the show where we're going to ask Cameron a question to name the first movie that comes to his head with whatever the question is about this is a terrible explanation what i'm going to say is Cameron name a movie that ha- name your favorite movie that has blank in it that's i don't know what we're going to call this section but we're going to call it something. Um, and we're just going to do a little bit of a trial run here. So, Cameron, remember, you're not going to overly think about this. I want you to just <laughs> blurt out the film that you think of when I when I tell you this. And okay. this is going to be a pretty simple, basic one for you. Cameron, what is your favorite movie that has an awesome vehicle in it? Go. Ooh. The Dark Knight. I knew it. I knew you were gonna go straight Batman. But there's so many. There's so many. Uh, there there's so some, many great. There's ones. some awesome vehicle movies. Although to be fair, um, usually in these movies, the vehicle is not the thing that I care about. Like, like Drive is a good example. Like, there's some cool vehicles in Drive, but me. Yeah. Well, I was thinking because I come up with these questions for you. The first, the first few that popped in my head, number one was the DeLorean from Back to the Future. It's great because that's, that's a, great, that's a great plot device. And number two was the oil tanker from Mad Max Fury Road, which I oh, just think is yeah. like one of the coolest vehicles in in a movie. All of the vehicles in Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like I just love that the setting is like this moving like I that's that's such a cool like setting for a movie to take place in. Hundred uh, percent. All right, well, uh, yeah, that's going to be a new section where I just try to pick Cameron's brain. Obviously, they're not going to be like, oh, what's your favorite movie with like an ice cream cone in it or something? Maybe it'll be that stupid. But like what I <laughs> really like to... Stitch. Yeah, I'd like to get... 
<laughs> oh my goodness. See, yeah, I'd like to get some pretty obscure questions in here, like favorite movie starring a dolphin, Cameron. Go. Uh, I don't yeah. know any movies starring a dolphin. I don't exactly. think I've ever seen a movie starring a dolphin. Well, get, maybe we'll not be so specific, but like, let me see. Let me think if I, I, I don't want to burn through all of them, but you get the idea. So yeah. if you have any feedback on this section, we'll probably put it at the beginning of the show in our conversational section. Uh, just pick Cameron's brain for uh, stuff like that. It doesn't always have to be a movie. Maybe I'll do like Cameron, like what's your favorite horse in a movie or something like that. And you'll be like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> shadow facts from Lord of the Rings or something. That's a right? great, that's a great answer. That's probably so, what, what I would have decided actually. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. I spoke for you. Anyways. I think that wraps up the conversation, Cameron. Any closing thoughts? Anything that you want to tell the audience? Um, no, watch Drive. It's great. It's fun. It is good. All right, guys. We post every Monday. We're excited to see what next month is all about. We're probably going to pick a director or a theme. And then don't forget, Horror Month is coming back in October. I'm very excited for that. So we'll see you guys next week. Cinema Spectator is an ECFS Productions podcast that is fully funded on Patreon.com. Shout out to our producers, Darren O'Neill and Tim Smith for supporting the show and to the rest of you that support us at Patreon.com slash ECFS Productions. If you want to learn more about the benefits you can get, check out our Patreon. The show cannot happen without you great listeners, so we thank you for all your kindness and support. Music.